So I was on my four-wheeler. I was at the edge of a five-foot cliff. I was a little nervous because I had already decided I was going to try to launch my ATV off of it and land. Now, the way you handle this is by kind of getting near the edge, and then you, you full throttle it, and you kind of try to do a wheelie, and what theoretically happens is that you launch off of it and then land softly as though you're launching into clouds. I'm telling you the story, so you already know that's not what happened. I got nervous. I wasn't sure I wanted to do it. And at the bottom was a whole bunch of rocks, which made me more nervous, which is not good. You won't have a lot of confidence when you're doing this, right? And so I decide I'm doing it anyway. I'm dumb enough to do it when I don't have confidence. And I, I hit the throttle, probably not all the way, and the four-wheeler bogs down, which if you're not used to motorcycle language, that means instead of sounding like, it sounded like, okay? And so the four-wheeler, instead of launching off the cliff, I didn't full send it, and I went partway, the front end went straight down, it landed me straight on the rocks, and then the 500-pound four-wheeler landed on top of me. I was in pain, I knocked the wind out of me, I couldn't breathe, I couldn't even get the four-wheeler off of me, someone had to come, uh, two people had to come and rescue me. Why? What happened? Well, I was... I was here, I was at a spot where I needed to overcome a fear, and I wasn't able to fully send it. You see my t-shirt right here, right? Just send it. That's like a four-wheeler saying. You probably do it in other areas of life too, right? I need, I need to learn to full send. You all have barriers that you needed to overcome. Sometimes you've overcome them successfully, sometimes not. And one of the reasons you fail, whether it's sobriety or marriage or whatever it is, is because you don't fully send it. You kind of do this like halfway, like I think I'm trying type of thing. You know what I'm talking about? We all have these barriers. Like when, when you know, actually let's write this down first, okay? One problem with overcoming our problems is that we rarely full send. We rarely full send. Instead, we do what I like to call the halfway dabble. Right In school days, you would, you would try to study for a test, and instead of like fully sending and memorizing the facts and getting in there every night and working your butt off, you'd kind of look at your notes while, while reading The Simpsons. You know what I'm talking about? Or while watching The Simpsons, right? And, and some of you have handled this in, in, last week when we talked about what Jesus says about owning stuff and about having and wanting less. And we learned that our dopamine levels, scientists have proven what Jesus said, our dopamine levels get so high by owning and buying so much stuff that we can never get happy. We're always anxious because we actually own too much crap. And so some people are tempted to say, okay, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna get rid of some of my stuff. But instead of fully sending it, you like, you kind of like halfway do it. You're gonna get rid of 5% of your stuff and you're gonna stop buying a lot of stuff. But you're like, I, it just didn't work. I tried to get rid of some stuff and it didn't make me happier. That's because you didn't full send it. Are you on track with me right now? Is this making sense, right? You, you kind of halfway dabbled. Let's go ahead and write this down on our outlines. If you're with us today and you're a new guest here, there's some outlines in the chair in front of you, right underneath, and you can fill this out as we go. One problem with overcoming our problems is that we rarely, rarely full send. We've got to stop doing the halfway dabble. We've got to stop doing the halfway dabble. I like to say things out loud because it changes the way we learn it. Can, can we say this phrase right here? We've got to stop doing the halfway dabble. Today we're going to talk about full sin. And this series is about financial wisdom. If you're still dabbling with last week's topic, I want to challenge you to send it. Commit to it. Get rid of your crap. Get rid of all that. Like we said, we had three, the average American home has 300,000 items in it. Gosh, get rid of your stuff. You'll never be satisfied until you stop wanting and having so much, right? Full send, not halfway down. But now this week, I'm going to ask you to full send too. Today, we're talking about giving to the Lord. And by giving to the Lord, what I think scripture teaches is 10% of whatever we get in income goes to God through the church. Now, why would I include this? Because when we started the finance series, I said, hey, we're going to do three weeks on helping you get and feel better about our money. So why would I talk about giving to the Lord when I promise you that this series is gonna be about you feeling better about your money? You're gonna see what happens here. Now, if you're new here, I, I, I wanna 
just make this clear. We don't do this a whole lot, and there's not going to be a whole lot of guilt here, because he, here's what we're not going to do. Lock the doors. No one's leaving until I get all your tax forms, and everyone's going to give 10% this week, or you're not getting out. That's not what we're going to do, okay? That's, uh, that's not how we are. That's not how it's going to be. In fact, there's a Bible verse in 2 Corinthians 9, and the Bible actually says, I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over. Make up your own mind what you'll give. That will protect you against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. So if you're a guest here today, I just want you to know, I am not going to guilt you into giving today. I said, if you're a guest, if you're a member, I will. No, I'm just kidding. But the the point here is that we're not going to try to guilt anybody into giving. In fact, today, what I'm going to do, let let me just tell you what I'm going to do so you know ahead of time. First, we're going to study a section of scripture where you see someone give. Then we're going to make some logical points based off that scripture. And then we're going to see some scriptural cross-references. Cross-references are like verses that have to do with giving that aren't the main story, but I want to show you that the idea is throughout the whole Bible, okay? I want to give you some cross-references, and then I'll give you some practical application before we go, and then you can go home, and no one's going to follow you and track you down. (laughs) But the reason I'm just going to give it to you, and you're going to decide what to do with it, is because what I'm going to say today is either true and from Scripture, or it's not. It's either true, or it's not. It's either something God wants you to do, or it's not. And you've got to decide if this is something that God actually pushes us to do or not. And hopefully you'll see why spiritual and emotional life has to do with how you handle your finances. And then if you combine this week with last week's, you're going to see that if you do both of these together, you are going to feel 10,000 times different about your financial situation. Because we already saw from last week, 90% of Americans have stress about their financial situation. 65% of Americans feel like their financial difficulties are so bad they can't even overcome them. So today, I am not going to add stress. Today, if you follow through it, it'll actually remove stress from your life. Yeah, I'm serious about this. I'm I'm telling you this because I do it. I do this. My wife and I have done this. I teach my kids to do this because when you give to the Lord the right way, here's what happens. I'm going to make you a promise and you can see if I fulfill it or not. When you're given to the Lord, you will actually have less worry, more freedom. When you're tithing to the Lord, you're going to have less guilt and more joy. You're going to have less religious obligation and more God in your life. You're actually going to have less loneliness and more meaning in your life. Now, how is giving money going to do that? Well, we found out last week that finances are counterintuitive, right? Like everybody thinks, if I want to feel better and have more, I just need to collect more money and buy more things. That'll make me feel better. Well, we found out that that's the opposite of what we need to do. Because the less you own, the happier you feel. And we realize that what people believe about money is the wrong thing. That's why 90% of people are stressed out. So if you want to have and be better with your money, just do the opposite of what everybody else is doing. And if people are buying, you should not be buying. And if people aren't giving, then you should be giving. So that's the idea is that what we're doing is already wrong and causing stress. Let's change what we're doing. Now let's go to the book of Luke in the Bible. You got a book uh, of the Bible or you have the Bible in the chair in front of you. Looks like this. Bibles are really easy to use if you've never used one. So we're going to read Luke 7. So turn to page 839. And when you get there, you'll find a big number 7. Right? The, the, the big numbers are chapter numbers. And the little numbers are verse numbers. So when we say go to Luke chapter 7, you go to Luke, you find the big 7. And then verse 36, you find that little tiny 36. So you go all the way down to two columns until you find that little tiny 36 in that third column. And we're going to read all the way through chapter 8, verse 3. Uh, those chapter and verse numbers, that, that wasn't in the original Bible. We just have those there, so it's easy to find your place. And sometimes they put those chapter dividers in weird places. And so I think Luke intended on chapter 7, the idea working all the way through chapter 8, verse 3. And you'll see why here in a second. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So Jesus is there eating dinner. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, 
She began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man, if Jesus were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she's a sinner. Jesus answered, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. All right, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii, the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them would love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said, Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house and you did not give me any water for my feet. So he's going to list some like traditional things that people do when you go to someone's house 2,000 years ago. You didn't give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she's poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever's been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this that even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him. Those are his closest followers. And also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. He was a really high up politician. Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support them, Jesus and the apostles, out of their own means. Meaning they had money and they regularly gave money to make sure Jesus and the followers could have their food, could have whatever they needed as they went about their, their way. So keep your Bible bookmarked. We're going to come back to there a little bit later and read just a little bit more from it. But Luke ends the story by pointing out that there were women who financially gave to Jesus to support his ministry, made sure that he had everything he had. Why? Because one of the subpoints of this story of the woman in the house was about her giving. Let's jump back to that, to that first verse uh, on this screen up here. Uh, when, when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Okay, so Pharisees, very religious people, as a lot of you know. Most of them did not like Jesus because Jesus was blowing up their traditions. He was teaching people to do stuff that they didn't do. He was saying the Pharisees are bad teachers. So the Pharisees didn't like him. But the Pharisees are really smart and they knew their scriptures and they knew the law. So Jesus goes and eats that this, guy, this Pharisee's house for dinner and they're talking, they're having conversations. It's probably really good. Maybe theological. Maybe they're just laughing, having a good time. Most likely there's a big crowd around because everywhere Jesus went, people followed. And then all of the stuff in the middle of this conversation, in the middle of this crowd, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was, the, so she found out Jesus is there at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. Okay, so this big crowd is there and this woman barges in. She's lived a sinful life. What does that mean? Well, people traditionally say maybe she was a prostitute, but that's not what it says, right? It, we don't know what the deal was. Maybe she was a prostitute. Maybe she was something. All, all we know is that people in town knew her. Oh, Gretchen's here. Great. You know, she had this reputation as being a bad person. Somehow she hears Jesus is in town, so she runs home. She grabs this jar full of perfume, and it's very likely that the jar contained perfume made out of nard, Nard costs about a year's worth of salary per pound. So even a very small amount of this perfume would be worth $50,000. That's expensive perfume, isn't it? And she pushes her way through the crowd until she gets inside the house. She's right up to Jesus. She's not asking. She is pushing her way to Jesus. And then what does she do? It says, as she stood behind him at his feet, weep. So she's, she's weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears. Right? She's, she's using her tears to clean his feet. And then she's wiping them with her hair. She's kissing them. And then, and then she's pouring the perfume on the feet of Jesus Christ. All of this is reverence. What is she doing? This is what you would call worship. This is worship. We tend to think of worship as music. We're singing some song, and worship is music. But worship is many things. But when she worships, what kind of worship did she do? She full sends it worship, right? I'm okay. 
She full sends it. She doesn't just worship like, okay, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to sing a little bit. I'm going to like, oh, 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 you know, like she is like wiping his, his feet with her hair. She's using $50,000 perfume. In fact, there's four ways. If you look at this verse, there's four ways that she was worshiping. She was emotionally engaged, right? She's crying. She's emotionally engaged. She's physically engaged, wiping his feet. And then in that culture, when you were wiping someone's feet like that, you were calling them your Lord. So she's mentally engaged because she believes something about Jesus. And she's pouring the expensive perfume. So she's fine financially engaged. I want to show these four to you. This is something you can write down your outline. Four aspects of true worship. If you're going to worship God, you want to emotionally be engaged, physically be engaged, like you're serving, like you emotionally you care, physically you serve, mentally you believe, and financially you give. These are four important aspects of worship. You can't be missing. She's doing all of them. Now, I'd like to ask you which one you're weakest at. You're not going to share with your neighbor. Please turn to your neighbor and tell you your worst part. No, we're not going to do that. Just think to yourself, like, which of these is the hardest for you? And a lot of people say, well, you know what? They naturally gravitate toward like, emotional. I, I don't get emotionally engaged enough. Or maybe, you know, maybe I don't believe hard enough. But really, the honest truth is, for most people, the financial is their hardest aspect of worship. In North America, only 5% of people give to God weekly. Only 5%. We got that chart? Only 5%. 18% give monthly. 77% of people give approximately whenever irregularly. But that's not full send worship. That's halfway dabble. And, and someone's thinking, I can hear your brain. Well, maybe they only give every once in a while, but like the lady with the perfume, you know, they give like a whole bunch right in that moment. Like she gave 50,000 like right there. Well, look, look, that lady gave more later on in her life. That wasn't a one-time thing. But also the 77% here, according to the stats, the 77% group only give 30% of what goes to God. Isn't that interesting? And 70% of what goes to God comes from the small group of people who give regularly. Why is that? Because you have people who full send and you have people who halfway dabble. That's it. 70% of donations come from a small number of people. They're like the lady who are fully sending it, honoring and worshiping God as much as they can. So you know what comes next? When you got someone who full sends and worships with all of their heart, what comes next? Judgment from other people. Immediately, you get this Pharisee who's looking at her cross-eyed. When the Pharisee who invited Jesus saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he's gonna say Jesus is not a prophet. If Jesus was a prophet, he would know who's touching him. And what kind of woman he is? <laughs> he sounded just like that. So I'm just kidding. <laughs> what kind of, but you know, it's like this attitude. You, can you feel the attitude he's giving? Right, is he, is he concerned about who Jesus really is and what he should be doing? No, maybe he's embarrassed that he's not giving. Maybe he's embarrassed that she's doing what he should have done. Instead of judging this woman, he should say, you know what? I'm a sinner too, and I should be at Jesus' feet too. I should be worshiping him as well. But instead, he decides to judge this poor lady who's just there full sending it. See, the thing is, he wasn't there to worship. He was there to get something. Let's write this down. The Pharisee had an attitude problem. He didn't like sinners, and he wasn't there to truly worship Jesus. He wasn't there to worship Jesus, and that's why he couldn't just appreciate the powerful worship moment happening in front of him. There's another scriptural story where a different lady was washing Jesus' feet with really expensive perform, per perfume, and Judas, the fake disciple, you know, who turned Jesus in and got him killed, Judas, he said, we, you shouldn't be using that perfume to wash Jesus' feet. We should use that money for poor people. <laughs> One of the biggest differences is the attitude of a faker and the attitude of a true Christian when it comes to money. One of the biggest differences between a faker and a true Christian is their attitude about money. And in this case, their attitude about giving other people, giving their money. Sometimes you, people don't even like when others give. Let's write this down. Money is the great divider between true worshipers and fakers. 
Whether you have a lot or a little, the question is, do you give God what he is due in your life? Does God come first or does he get leftovers after someone else? You know, last week's sermon was called Overdrafted and we talked about this. My biggest money problem is that I think money is the problem. If I change the amount of stuff I have and want, then my worry, anxiety, and desire will change. All right, so the practical application of this from last week, if you weren't here, was get rid of your stuff. Right, the average American home is 300,000 things. We already said that. You got to get rid of stuff because the more you have and the more you want, the worse you actually feel. Having too much stuff is an obstacle to your happiness. So you have to have an attitude change that says, I'm going to fully send it. I'm, scum- I'm going to stop buying and shopping all the time. I'm going to stop owning everything. I'm going to have less. And my attitude about owning things needs to change. Well, today, an attitude change needs to happen too. There are two kinds of attitudes when it comes to giving the Lord money. It's that I love God, and I'm going to worship, and I'm going to serve, and I'm going to know him better, and I'm going to passionately give to him like that lady did. Or I'm going to question him I don't know. Why would he want me to do that? I'm, I'm going to doubt, can God actually take care of me if I give him what he owes, what I, what I am supposed to? Or whining, I just don't want to do it. Or, or stingy. Some people are like, well, I'm not a stingy person. You know, I tip waitresses really well. <laughs> That's nice to know that you tip waitresses. What about your God? Right? I mean, you can't really call yourself a generous person if you're leaving God out of the equation. Let's write this down. My attitude likely puts me in a category of loving God, worshiping, serving, and giving. Or my attitude puts me in a category of questioning, doubting, whining, and stinginess. You're either one or the other. Someone messaged in and said, the cravings of the sluggard will be the death of him. That's a good verse for uh, last week's sermon, right? We crave things. And our cravings actually end up killing us. So we need to have a different attitude, right? So the attitude back to today's stuff, the attitude, which, which attitude are we going to have when it comes to giving to the Lord? You're either one or the other. And your, incl- and your inclination might be to say, well, I may not be great at passionate giving, you know, but I really worship and sing really loud. Or, or you know, I, I, might have some, I might have some doubts or be a little bit stingy, but I really know God very well. And I would suggest that's impossible. If you remember the study from last week about the people in the coffee shop, let me explain it really briefly for those of you who weren't here. They did a study on people who consider themselves lucky or unlucky. And lucky people would go into a coffee shop and they would talk to people and they would make business deals and, and they, would, they would strike up conversations and, and they would end up having all these crazy things happen just because they talked to strangers. And people who consider themselves unlucky were put in the same coffee shop and they would like read their book and then go home and talk to nobody. And the, re- the reality was being lucky was something that happened to them because of some behavior deep inside of them, right? And so we compared it to the trees. Like if a tree gets sunlight and if a tree gets, gets water, then oh, it's going to grow. Like life is going to come out of here because of what happened under the surface. But if, but if the, nothing is happening under the surface, you get death, What's happening under the surface changes your luck, changes your finances, changes everything. In fact, what you believe and think, your attitude on the inside will always come to the outside and affect your real life. In fact, this is, this is important, let's write it down. The attitude on the inside always shows up on the outside. The attitude on the inside always shows up on the outside. Can we say this? The attitude on the inside always shows up on the outside. Whatever's inside will come to the surface. You plant a tree in good soil and give it good water and good nutrients, you're going to get a good tree. But if you plant something in the ground and you give it nothing, it's just, it's going to die. Sorry, guys. It's going to die, right? This tree will never come to life because it didn't get what it needed. And you cannot say, well, I love God so much if that's not what's going on on the inside. 
And what goes on on the inside will come to the outside with your worship, with your knowledge, with your money. The plant can't full send and produce fruit because it's, it's dead. It can't, it can't even full send and produce fruit if it gets a little bit of nutrients here and there, which is some people's habit of giving, right? A little bit here and there when I can. No, like you, you see it's all over in the book of Proverbs in the Bible. And this is why the woman pouring perfume lived the way she did. She was forgiven so much that on the inside she really loved Jesus so she could full send give because she felt it on the inside. Is this making sense? Right? She felt it, so she did something about it. Uh, last week, we also talked about neuroadaptation and how your brain gets used to things like your level of dopamine. And your brain adjusts to the current level of dopamine you have. And if you own too many things, your dopamine level goes too high, which means you need even more and more and more just to feel happy. And that's why you got to get rid of stuff. So your brain adapts, neuroadapts to a lower level of ownership. And then all of a sudden, whoo. Taking a walk with a loved one makes you happy again, right? You got to lower that level of dopamine. And what you want to do is not get dopamine from things on the outside. You want dopamine to be produced naturally because of who you are on the inside and what's happening inside of you. That's a natural way to produce it. Like this lady who was giving everything to Jesus, she was 100% satisfied in the presence of Jesus because of how she felt on the inside, Her brain was producing dopamine in that moment, not because she found some trinket, but because her mind and her values and her soul had all lined up, her moral choices had all lined up to worship Jesus in that moment. You would actually be a happier person if instead of worrying about money and owning stuff, your brain and desires and your moral compass about what God deserves all lined up together and you were giving instead of buying. So instead of shopping and going, I know I can't afford it, but I need more dopamine and I really need to get on Amazon, man. Facebook Marketplace is calling my name. By the way, did anybody feel guilty when they got on Facebook Marketplace this week, <laughs> right? I, did, I jumped on there a couple of times and actually I'm like, oh, I can't do this now, crap, right? It just happens, right? It just happens. And so like you're jumping on and you're like, realize, I can't do this anymore. Instead of like just naturally shopping, like we realize that can't give me satisfaction anymore. And you know what's funny? Is the whole idea about giving to God making you happier than shopping has been proven scientifically. Again, I love it when the scientists catch up to Jesus. There was a company that gave out loans and they did a research project on money. My guess is that they just wanted to convince people to take out more loans, but they discovered something surprising. Givers are happier than buyers. By how much? This this is how much. Those who regularly donate have levels of happiness as though they got a $36,000 raise. Could you imagine going into work tomorrow and your boss being like, hey, come in here. And you're like, okay, I'm going to give you a raise. Oh, how much? Three, three dollars an hour. That's pretty good. Zero, thirty dollars, zero, zero, three thousand, three thousand what? Three thousand dollars a month. That's how much of a raise I'm going to give you. Like, you wouldn't believe it was real probably, right? Like, what is happening here? You go home and... You wouldn't do it now because you've heard last week's sermon, but you go home and want to buy a new boat, right? You'd spend it all. Like, you'd be like, wow, this is crazy. You have this level of happiness by getting a $36,000 rate. But listen, scientists have found out that when you give God what he's due, when you give God 10%, your level of happiness goes up as though you got a $36,000 raise. Isn't that crazy? Listen, God's commands are for your good. They're for your good. Uh, open your Bible back up. We're going we're gonna to love it. Because, again, I love it when science catches up to Jesus. And this is, this is what uh, Jesus was, was telling us here. Someone, while you, while you turn there, someone says, what if you're a kid? Is there any difference in giving for kids? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so may, I'm, I'm thinking maybe the person who a- asked this question is a kid. Let me, let me ask you this question if you're a kid. Is God your God? Do you actually love God? If you do, then I think you as a kid should give just like your parents should give. My wife and I, we don't force our kids to give, but we encourage our kids to give 10% of everything they get. 
Sometimes they listen, sometimes they, some of them listen better than others, right? Just like, sometimes just we're normal, we're all humans. But parents, I think you should teach your kids to give so they grow up with a habit of giving. It's a really good, really good, uh, my, my, I don't think she'd be mad that I shared this. My daughter, Aaliyah, who's now 18, she's living in Kansas City, working up there. She's, she's got this spreadsheet. She called me the other day. She's like, Dad, can we work on our budget? I'm like, sure. She's got a category for giving, and she's making sure she gives regularly. And like, I'm just so proud of her. And like, my dopamine level went higher because she's chosen to give after she moved away. Like that to me, that made me happy as a dad that she puts God higher than her own selfish desires. Like that was cool. That was cool. Someone says, I, I personally discovered the more I dig in, into walk with Jesus and knowing God, the more I desire giving to the church. I, I feel like they go hand in hand and cannot be separate, right? They can't. And, and so you turn back to where we're reading. Uh, I want you to go to verse 40. I'm going to read to verse 48. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, you see this woman? I came to your house. You didn't give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears. She wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But who's ever been forgiven little loves little. In this story, Jesus is talking about these two guys got debts. One guy a little, one guy, the, one guy owed a year and a half worth of salary. That's how much it was. The other guy owed about two months of salary. That's a lot of money. But one was way bigger than the other. And the Pharisees are like, well, the guy who was forgiven that much, he's certainly going to love more. And Jesus is like, yes. He's been forgiven more, so he loves more. And the woman who had been forgiven so much loved Jesus much, and that's why it was coming out. Because the attitude on the inside always shows up on the outside. Why are givers happier than buyers? Because whatever's on here comes to the outside. If you are empty, you need to buy. But if you are full, you need to give. Why are givers happier than buyers? They also have something to be happy about. Their happiness is not based on external trinkets. Their happiness is based on the fact that they know a God whom they want to honor with their own wealth. Their happiness is based on something inside of them instead of something outside of them which will be broken or stolen or fade away. Let's write this down. Jesus explains to the Pharisee that the woman loved and worshiped Jesus so much because she had been forgiven much. The inside was expressed on the outside. It always will be. Her joy in giving came from the inside and is 100% different than the joy someone gets from buying stuff. Givers are happier than buyers. Scientifically proven, Jesus said it. It's all through scripture. <clears throat> and today, one of the points I'm making is that full send givers are the ones who are actually happier than buyers. Because as a follower of Jesus, when you know what you're supposed to give, you're not giving it. Your body knows it, even if you're not acknowledging it. Whatever's on the inside comes to the outside. If you, now, if you don't believe you've been forgiven, then you're not gonna wanna give. But realizing how much God has forgiven you will change your behavior. So what you do is you start putting God in the right place. And you treat in him like the Lord in every area of your life. And that will 100% affect you, mind, body, emotions, and finances. So, like we said last week, get rid of your stuff. Stop wanting so much stuff. Stop shopping for so much stuff. And now you know you also need to bow down to God and give God what he's due. By the way, Let's get into some of these cross-references. Did you know that when you honor God with big generosity, that changes how God acts towards you? It's actually true. This is Luke 16. Jesus is talking, and he says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Can we just say that together? Let's read that together. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And then he goes on, he says, and whatever is dishonest, or whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So, he says, if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? 
And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, God's property, who will give you property of your own? Wow. You only have a little bit right now? Jesus says, if I can't trust you with the little bit you got, why would I give you more? That's crazy. But Jesus said it. It's what's inside of you that matters. If Jesus says, look, look, if, if when you just get a little bit, you're like, mine, mine, all I have is a little bit, mine. He says, that is actually indicative of how you're going to be when you get more. If you only give a little when you have a little, you're only going to give a little when you have a lot. If you, if you don't give when you have a little, Jesus says, then I just can't trust you with a lot. Well, I don't have that much to give. Even 10% is a lot for me. Yeah, 10% is a lot. Jesus wants to know that you're going to trust him a lot, whether you have a little or a lot. Let's write this down. Jesus said that if you cannot trust me with a little money, I won't be trustworthy with a lot because it comes from the heart. Would you circle the, circle the word heart there? It comes from the heart. What you're doing comes from inside of you. So if you're generous with God when he gives you a thousand bucks, then you will be generous with God when he gives you a hundred thousand bucks. Because faith and generosity come from inside of you and not from your situation. If you're stingy with God when he gives you a thousand dollars, you'll be stingy forever because that's who you are on the inside. Luke chapter 11 talks, oops, I missed that slide. Uh, Luke chapter uh, 16, verse 11 says this. Okay, the attitude on the inside always shows up on the outside. If you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? He's like, man, if I, if I give you some worldly money and you mess that one up, why would I give you something real? I'd like to ask yourself, just ask yourself, whether or not you've halfway dabbled or full sent when it comes to giving to the Lord. And I'm not saying this as a fundraiser. I'm saying this because I 100 believe in the depths of my soul that scripture teaches to do this. And I'm not asking anyone here to do anything different than me. My wife and I have been doing 10% or more since we were married 23 years ago. We've been teaching our kids to do it their whole lives. And my suggestion is 10% or more of whatever you earn, um, whatever you receive. I saw someone send in an interesting question that I've never... When calculating your income, do you include food stamps? Um, you know, I don't know. I think the verse that we read at the very beginning applies. You know, because the, the verse, that, hey, will you, Ashley, will you th throw up the very first verse we read about deciding in your heart to give? I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over, make up in your own mind what you will give, okay? Well, what's one of the points? That, why does it word it like that? Even though 10% is throughout the Bible, and I'm going to show you in a little bit here. And one of the reasons why I think it does say that is because some situations are sticky. Like, do you give off your food stamps? What about when someone takes you out for dinner? Technically, they just gave you 20 bucks. Do you then have to tie the... Like, I, I don't think, you know, when someone takes me out to dinner, I don't go home and put money in an envelope for God somewhere. But when I get an income, I do. So I, I think the question for you is, do you feel like food stamps are part of your income that you should give to the Lord? Or is it like a gift that doesn't count towards that? I, I don't really know the right answer to this question. But I think inside your heart, you have a feeling one way or another, whether this is actual income or whether this is just something beyond that. And you've got to make a decision for yourself. Same thing comes when people ask the question, should I give off my gross or my net income? You know what? I think the question is, are you going to full send and give? Not, is it gross or is it net or is it a food stamp or is it not like, are you going to give God what he's due? And if you decide gross, then fine. If you decide net, then that's fine. But whatever you do, just don't halfway dabble. Does that make sense? You've got to make a decision in your mind and you've got to follow through on it. Um, let's go back here. Uh, this is, this is the, these are some of the verses about 10%, just so you know where they come from. Abraham, this is, Hebrews 7 talked about Abraham. Abraham is 
Genesis, right? This is like the very beginning of the Bible. You see, Abraham gave God 10% of everything he had. It says that in Hebrews 7. So the very beginning, this is before Israel was a nation, before the guy who started Israel even existed, Abraham's already doing 10% as a standard. We get to Jacob. This is where Israel comes from. And Genesis 28, doing 10% here. Then it becomes a law in the nation of Israel. But giving 10% wasn't the law in Israel. You know what the law in Israel was? You give 10% to the priests. 10% to the temple, then 10% to the poor every three years, and then free will giving on top of that. So it was really 30 to 40%. And then Jesus reaffirmed the concept of 10% in Luke 11, 42. And then the New Testament examples after Jesus, like in Hebrews 7, 2, you see it multiple places where this idea of a tithe is reaffirmed. So this is why I say, I see it everywhere in scripture. That's why I do it. I think it's a huge, our church does it. When anyone gives offering here, our church takes 10% of everything we have and we give it to another organization. And some of that money goes overseas to help other churches. Some of that money helps start new churches. Some of that money goes to a bishop so he can help manage our, our, all our churches around here. Because even as a church, we do this. I believe it's a biblical number. So, so interesting thing about 10% is some people say, but I just don't have, like, I just don't have very much. But the beauty of giving 10%, God did this in his wisdom, is that if you're wealthy, 10% is more. And if you're poor, 10% is less. Isn't that true? That's how percentages work, right? You remember seventh grade? 10%, though, is still enough that it takes a sacrifice. Nobody can give 10% without changing their lifestyle. It's that full send attitude. You know, if you earn $2,000 a month, you're going to give God through the church 200 bucks. If you earn $10,000 a month, you're going to give God $1,000 a month or more. 10% is the number we see throughout scripture. And I want want you to be happier than if you got a $36,000 raise. Last week I told you, want less. Now I'm literally telling you, give more. Sounds like an old beer commercial, right? <laughs> Want less? No, give more. <laughs> like, like, no. Look, but in Malachi 3, God, God's, do you all know what I'm talking about, the beer commercial? What was that? I shouldn't talk about it here. I got too many alcoholics. All right, Malachi 3.8. It says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me, God says. But you ask, how are we robbing you? How are we robbing you, God? He's like, you're robbing me. You want to know why God accused them of robbing him? Verse 8 and 9 says, in tithes and offerings, you're under a curse. Your whole nation, because you're robbing me. Then he says in verse 10 and 11, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. So Malachi 3 is summed up with this idea. He's talking to the Jewish people as you robbed God because you didn't tithe. Right? That, that's a fascinating thing. He, God considers it robbery. He says, do the entire thing, full send it. And he says, I'll bless you if you do it. And then he says this crazy line, test me in this. Do you know in the Bible to test God is considered a sin? Do not test the Lord your God. But here he says, test me. This is the one place that's not a sin. Now we want to be careful. He was talking to the Jewish people and their nation. He's not talking to Americans. So if we all started tithing today, that doesn't guarantee America is going to get better. I'm very sorry. All right. It's just, I don't know why I did that. All right. Because this was to their nation. But if they all fully sent and tithe, their entire nation was going to get better. I think this is the crazy principle though, isn't it? The idea that the one place where it wasn't a sin to test God was with the money. He's like, I want to throw open the doors and bless you. You don't think I can do this? Try me, bro. God saw tithing as 10% as, as a good thing. Why? Because it comes from the inside and God is concerned with your inside. If you're giving a lot, it's because you love God a lot. But if you're halfway dabbling, that says something too, doesn't it? Let's write this down. Here's some practical application. How do I change my internal state so I want to give? I must recognize my sin, confess and ask forgiveness like the lady in the story, identify any obstacles that keep me far from God. What was it Jesus said? Whoever's been forgiven much loves much. If you want to be a better giver, first you have to recognize that you really need Jesus. Every single person in this room was a sinner who had done evil and rejected God with our behavior. If you agree with that, just say amen. Amen. 
We'd all done it, right? Every one of us. Jesus went to the cross to pay a price for our sins. God punished him instead of punishing you. Scripture says that if you believe Jesus lived, died, and rose from the dead, and if you follow him, then you'll be forgiven for your sins. Here we got red cards in the chair in front of you. And if you want to be baptized and follow Jesus, let us know. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. But the first thing you have to do before you can be a good giver is to actually know that God has forgiven you and to follow him, to love him. The second thing you should do is, if you're already a believer, is realize you've got some obstacles here that are in the way of you loving God the right way. The, the Pharisee who refused to worship God, he saw Jesus just like the lady did. Why was he different? Something blocked his view of Jesus. He had a sinful he had a sinful barrier between. For him, it was unbelief. He didn't really believe in Jesus. For you, it might be porn. It might be mistrust of God or materialism. Whenever you find something blocking your way to God, you need to kill it. You need to kill it. You need to dump it, get rid of it. And then you'll have this path to walk to God because you'll be more full of love. So kill your sin so that you can love God fully. And then you actually have to decide to tithe. You actually have to decide. You have to do it. Full send all the way. Stop halfway down. I remember in college, I met this girl named Meadow. And it was my freshman year. I went to college to have a good time, not to meet a wife. And I met her and right away I was in love with her and I thought, this is not good. And so what did I do for like the first year, two years of knowing her? I like, I was like, oh, hey, Meadow, how you doing? Oh, you want to hang out? Wow, I really like you a lot. This is great. And she's like, how much do you like me? And I'm like, I got to go. Right? <laughs> like, I got, like I was halfway dabbling for a long time. But then you know what happened? She went on a date with another guy. <laughs> Why do you like, woo, no, boo. She went on a date with another guy. And then I realized like, no, I got to full send it, right? I can't let her get away. And so I was like, I asked her out. Finally, I was like, let's be boyfriend and girlfriend. And I knew at that moment I was going to marry that lady. I dated her for a year. Then we were engaged for nine months. And then we got, that was like almost 25 years ago. And I've never looked back. Don't look back. Stop halfway dabbling with the Lord. In the chair in front of you, there is a card that talks about committing to the Lord. With, with finances, and I want you to look at it. It's, it's got three options on there. And I'm gonna ask you to turn this into the red boxes, the same place you put your red cards. If you're ready to commit, then you do it, fully send it. I'll commit to giving 10% or more of my income to God through the church for 90 days. Just try it for 90 days. And then you can send any testimonies about what happened during those 90 days to us. I want to hear them. There's another box that says, I already give 10%. And I'm going to continue to do this for at least 90 days. Again, send us your testimonies. The interesting thing about these testimonies, I've been a pastor for over 20 years. I really want you to hear this. I've been a pastor for well over 20 years. And I've never had one person come to me and say, I started tithing and it turned out bad. Never had that happen but I have countless stories of people who said, I started tithing and you wouldn't believe what God did. I have so many. I want you to, I want you to tell me what happens because I think it's gonna be good. There's another box here that says I'm not ready for a full sin yet, but maybe. And I want someone from the church to contact me. So we have a number of couples in the church who I've talked to who said, I'll be there if someone wants to talk. And if, if, you're, if you're kind of feeling like, you know what, I, I wanna do this, but I don't know how to make it work in my budget. Or I want to do this, but, but I, I got some questions first. I want you to meet with someone. Now, I'm not going to lie. These are people who believe in fully sending it. They're not going to meet with you and be like, don't do it. No, they're not, right? But, but maybe you could meet with them and maybe you have some questions that they could help answer. And, and if you check that box, they'll get in contact with you in the next couple days and, and set something up where they can, they can meet with you. Because sometimes it just takes looking at your budget differently. And sometimes it just takes a, a friend saying, everything looks safe. I, I think you're going to be okay. You know, and, and what I said at the beginning of this, I, I made a promise to you. When you full send give, you have less worry and more freedom, less guilt, and more joy, less religion and more God, less loneliness and more meaning, right? Same thing as our dopamine. You're going to worry less when you're giving to God more. 
you're going to feel less guilt because you're not going to come in here and get this little twinge of like, oh, I didn't really get, no, 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 no. You're not going to have like this conflict. You're going to know you're doing exactly what God asked you to do. And you're going to feel freedom to live the way you want to live with the rest of your money. You're going to have less religion. The Pharisee had religion, but he did not have God. You know what I'm talking about? So you're going to end up with less of this religious crap and more of God. You're going to less loneliness and more meaning. What does that mean? Well, that woman who knew Jesus, she actually knew Jesus. That Pharisee was the alone one in that room. I'm going to ask you right now, who do you think was happier, that Pharisee or that woman who Jesus forgave and who was just lavishing worship on Jesus? I think she was a happier person than he was. I think he was a stingy, greedy, angry little man. And you don't want to be that. Just let me ask you some more questions, then I'll, then I'll uh, finish up. We're, we're almost done here. Um, someone says, when Gideon tested God multiple times, was that considered sinful? Okay, so there's a story about a guy named Gideon, and God tells him to go to war. And so he's like, this is a pretty big deal, right? And so he puts out this fleece out of his front door. He's like, God, please make it so that dew shows up on the fleece, but not the grass. Then it happens the next morning. He's like, okay, God, I'm going to try one more time. This time, make it so that dew shows up on the grass, but not the fleece, just to make sure it's you. And then it happens. So he asked for signs from God, and God did it. Was it a sin? I don't think it was a sin because he wasn't testing God. He was testing himself to make sure he had heard from God. And there's a difference. He's like, God, I want to make sure that this is really you and not just me. So help me out here. And he's asking God for a sign. Now, that's not normally how you ask God for clarification, right? Nowadays, we have the Holy Spirit. You use the word of God. You use your wisdom. You use your gut feeling. You use the community of people around you. And you use prayer. And if all those things line up, then you know that God's probably with you on it. Okay. Um, that's a good question, though. Someone says, poor dead tree. We will replant you. <laughs> Okay. All right. So look, let's get out of here. But but what could happen to you if you show up or if God shows up when you start to give? Like you prove yourself with a little. What what could God do now? Because he can trust you with a lot. You could have less anxiety and more happiness because you're putting God first with your finances. Could you imagine you start overcoming your sin? You start giving God what he's due. You actually own less and have higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress. And your moral compass, your religion, your love for God, your finances are all lined up perfectly. You are actually going to be a more satisfied person than you have been before. And then come back next week. Because next week we're going to talk about, so last week was overdrafted, this is overcoming, next week's overflowing. We're actually going to talk about how to actually save money, and we're going to look at some of the practices God teaches us that you actually have, not just own less stuff, but actually have more dollars. So be back here. Let's pray. God, we pray in Jesus' name that you'll help us to full send this, commit to you, and trust you. In Jesus' name. Oh God, uh, if someone here is scared, I pray that you help them to overcome their fear and that you would show up in their life. You give them comfort about who you are and not about how the situation looks for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.